Welcome viewers to our ongoing Nuclear Free Future conversation here from the studio of the Center for Media and Democracy in Burlington, Vermont. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, and viewers, let's welcome our special guest. To my right is Grayson Webb from Fairwinds Energy Education. Welcome, Grayson. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and welcome back, Arnie Gunderson, hey, Margaret. Chief nice Engineer from Fairwinds Energy Education. So Happy the holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holiday. It's hard to believe we're at the end of 2016, one of the longest years in history. So, <laughs> Thankfully but, it's over. Almost. Right, almost over. But we're beginning also on a new push for uh, putting, uh, first of all, the title of our, of our program is Nuclear Power Makes Global Warming worse. And what I was going to say, Grayson, is that we're at the beginning of a new push to make nuclear power the alternative to the, uh, the uh, global warming. And, or, and uh, this, uh, you, you both claim, is wrong and saying that the nuclear solution to climate change is a smokescreen. So can you start off with what, what do you mean by that, the smokescreen? Yeah, let me start. Um this has been an 18-month process. I was asked to give a speech at um, Northwestern mm -hmm. last April, so not a couple months ago, but the year before. Uh -huh. And I, um, I contacted two global experts, a guy named Amory Lovins, who everybody might know, and another guy named Michael Schneider, and they sent me 60-page PowerPoint presentations each. And I turned those 120 PowerPoint slides into a 20-minute no-slide presentation at Northwestern that had half a million people read about it in Forbes magazine. So I guess I did a pretty good job. But I realized there's a lot of data there. So we, um, uh, Maggie uh, contacted University of Vermont, and we asked for some student interns to, uh, to help crunch this enormous amount of data into a, a, a real cogent report. And uh, we picked up four student senior interns, and, and Grayson was one. Um, and a good message there for um, uh, viewers, um, student internships can turn into jobs because Grayson is now an employee. Um, and they ground numbers for three and a half or four months to get an ironclad argument on um, how much carbon dioxide is created, how little nuclear power actually prevents, and, um, and all of that analysis um, was done by student interns like Grayson. And um, we also had Bob Herendine, a, a Burlington Vermonter, and uh, uh, Les Cannon from Johnson State. We had two PhDs, the Fairwinds crew, and four student interns working for the better part of a year to come up with the uh, presentations we've been giving lately. So we started with the conclusion that the nuclear, the nuclear solution is a smokescreen, and and it, it's a smokescreen for what? What what is what is what is what trick is being played on us? Uh, well, basically, nuclear is just not cost efficient. Renewables are much more cost efficient and can be built in a much shorter time span than nuclear can, and so they're just trying to latch on to whatever thing they can to make themselves seem uh, feasible. Are they saying that nuclear power does reduce the CO2? Uh, well, they're saying since it doesn't put out any CO2, it is a green source of energy. And is that true? <laughs> that no, nuclear? Even, there's no, uh, no argument that you get a small uh, change in CO2 downward. It improves CO2, but at what cost? <laughs> and that's been the uh, that's really where the, the work of the interns was at. Mm. We um, we discovered that in 2050, so, so 35 years out, the nuclear industry wants to build a thousand new nuclear power plants. That's one nuke every 12 days for 35 years. And um, how much would that cost? It turns out it's eight trillion dollars. Mm. We um, we discovered that in 2050. So, so 35 years out, the nuclear industry wants to build a thousand new nuclear power plants. That's one nuke every 12 days for 35 years. And um, how much would that cost? It turns out it's eight trillion dollars. And those thousand new nukes would reduce carbon dioxide by six percent. That's it. 
0.6%. So uh, the point we tried to make and what Grayson was alluding to is this issue of it's a lot of money over a long time and you could be doing other things with that money. It's called an opportunity cost. Economists call it an opportunity cost. There's better ways to spend it quicker that would have a quicker impact on reducing CO2 gases and a more dramatic impact too. So are you saying that some organization, what organization is it that is, is uh, putting out this, this information that you have challenged? What organization is it? World Nuclear Organization is a European-based uh, umbrella group for all the nuclear power owners. Mm. And um, they've said a thousand nukes are needed to help the climate change issue. And uh, James Hansen, who's uh, the CO2 guy who came from NASA in 1988, identified global warming and CO2 buildup as um, the direct linkage between them. He says 2,500. So that would be a nuke every four days for the next 35 years if you want to meet Hansen. But we use the World Nuclear Association number and 1,000. Um, and we used uh, an investment bank's cost. And we came with $8 trillion bucks. That's a lot of money, no matter <laughs> how you count it. And for what? And it was a 6% improvement in, in CO2. It, it, why do we want to spend that amount of money when, as Grayson said, you got renewables and uh, uh, can be built faster and cheaper? And, and Grayson, is it true that our, our CO2 level is going up every year no matter what we do? Uh, yeah, currently, um, because the CO2, basically, it takes a while for the emissions to get into the atmosphere, and then it'll take a while for it to, to stabilize even after we stop producing emissions. So even if we stop today, the rates will keep climbing for a little bit. And what is the main reason for this? Is it, is it development, like developing nations and, and that sort of thing? Is it the, the improvement in our, what we have, like our appliances and all of that sort of thing, a better standard of living? Yeah, you know, if we, if we Americans go to solar, there's still a pent-up demand in India and Southeast Asia and Africa that want to live like us. And if they start to build coal plants, CO2 is going to go up. There's a study out of MIT that says that in the best of circumstances, CO2 is still going to double in the next 35 years, even if you re implement a thousand new nuclear plants and renewables because of this pent up demand. Everybody wants a car worldwide and everybody wants a house that has heat. And, and how can we blame people for wanting to live the way we do as Americans. So uh, it's important then to, to try to not nip the demand because I, th I think everybody has a right to live the way we do, but to change the paradigm that the energy's produced. And that's really what we're, we're talking about. So Grayson, tell us how, what was your first approach when, when first of all, uh, what was, are you still in the university now? Or are you uh, I have since graduated. Just oh, okay. this last uh, spring. Congratulations. Thank you. And yeah. What degree? Uh, environmental science with a concentration in ecological design. Okay. So this was all right up your alley. Mm -hmm. So what was the first, uh, first step? Was it getting people together with you or, or what? Um, well, for one of my senior classes, uh, Ernie and Maggie came in and, or actually Caroline, a former uh, employee came in and kind of gave a brief interview, uh, a talk discussing what they needed from us and uh, me and three other students all uh, decided that really sounded like an interesting uh, arrangement. Um, personally, I was kind of on the fence about nuclear. I didn't really know what I thought about it because of the obviously the it doesn't produce CO2 but you have all these risks associated with it and so I really picked up on this uh, assignment as a way to kind of better inform myself. Um, and so, yeah, the three other interns and I started at Fairwinds, and Arnie got us started right off the bat and gave us a ton of really great information and gave us a lot of uh, oversight. You know, the, the, there's one number that everybody agrees on, and that's the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And back in, like, 1960, 
this really bright guy in Hawaii decided he better start measuring CO2 in the atmosphere. And it's called the Mauna Loa data. Mauna Loa is a place in Hawaii where the data has consistently been taken. And so we know CO2 was about 320 parts per million in 1960, and it's now over 400 parts per million in um, uh, 2015. So that's good numbers. There's no doubt that, that that's the case. But the, what we, the crazy thing we found is nobody knows how much CO2 we're throwing up every year. You know, you've got all these smokestacks, all these cars, um, all these um, sources, thousands and thousands of sources, and nobody has a monitor on every source. So the amount of CO2 that's getting thrown up in the air was about, it took us about a month to figure it out, and it's um, 35,000 million tons of CO2 every year goes up into the atmosphere, 35,000 million. Uh, it's called a gigaton, but I like to think of thousands of millions. It's a, a huge number. And um, we, we wound up, we, what do we have, like 10 sources or something to figure that out? Yeah. yeah. Could so you give us some idea of how, how you did figure it out? Um, it was just a lot of research online, looking through academic papers. Um, uh -huh. And then, of course, you have to check the reference to see if it's unbiased or not. And so basically what we ended up doing is uh, I believe we found kind of several that seemed appropriate and then kind of took an average based on those. Right, right. So that was the, the first step was finding out how much we throw up every year. Then uh, there's a good study out of MIT that talks about, well, whatever we're at, it's almost going to double because of this pent-up demand in the, in the developing world. Um, that was the second piece. Then the third piece was figuring out how much nuclear could save. And from that, we went right to the nuclear industry. And it's interesting, there's a, a case of bias. When the American uh, nuclear uh, trade group called uh, NEI talks about how much carbon dioxide their power plants are saving, they use the dirtiest coal. And nobody builds a dirty coal plant anymore, but they always compare to the dirtiest coal plant. But the World Nuclear Association compares to the cleanest gas plant. So uh, when you use the World Association number, you get half the amount of CO2 that the nuclear plants save that the Americans do. So everybody's trying to spin a number. And, um, uh, and the last piece was the cost. And there we found an investment bank. And they don't have a dog in this fight. You know, it's, it's money to them. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's Lazard, which is an investment banker. And um, we took the number of power plants times the cost that the investment banker said the power plants would cost. And we come up with $8 trillion to make a 6% improvement in global warming. Why are we doing this? Mm. Grayson, what surprised you the most from what, in mm. your learning curve <laughs> as you dove into this? What, what was the most surprising thing? I guess... The most surprising thing was just how much cheaper uh, wind power was um, compared to everything. And we factored in uh, capacity factor, um, which is the, like, uh, the amount of time that an uh, energy source is able to actually produce energy. So for wind, it's, the wind doesn't blow all the time. So it has like a 40% capacity mm -hmm. factor. Nuclear is about 90%. And so that even factoring that in, wind is... is almost half as much as nuclear, I believe, to receive, to get the same goal. Very so, interesting. Yeah. So you've got a power plant now being proposed in England, and um, it's going to cost $28 billion. And, of course, the, the English coast is very windy, and the output from the windmills would be four times cheaper. And the British government is so locked on buying these nuclear plants that they're absolutely refusing to consider the windmills. And those nukes would come online in about 2030. And you could slap up the windmills in the next five years. So you can make an immediate dent in CO2. And you can do it cheaper. Why wouldn't you want to do that? And the reason, and this is why the smoke screen, because somebody's making a boatload of money. And who, what is that? It's a nuclear consortia. Uh, the American names are General Electric and Westinghouse, but in fact, 
General Electric is owned by a Japanese firm, Hitachi, and then Westinghouse is owned by Toshiba. So, you know, they come to Congress and they appear to be an American company, but all these components are made in Japan and South Korea and China. So when you hear about, well, yeah, they may be expensive, but it's good American jobs, that's not true. All that work is going to Japan and Korea and China. Um, so th they are international consortia that are lining up for trillions of dollars in handouts. And the, mo the more um, nuclear power plants are being built in Asia and not, in South not America? That many. You know, the, there's about 40 right now being built over there. Um, and um, uh, out of the world has 450. So less than 10% more nuclear power plants are being built. Now, Vietnam just pulled out. They, they were going to build a half a dozen nuclear power plants. They said, this is too expensive. So uh, good for the Vietnamese. And uh, um, the, the Taiwanese just pulled out. They're not going to build any new nukes. And of course, the Germans are, are phasing back. So a lot of um, countries that were projected to go nuclear are not. And uh, I hope it's our message that's getting through. But uh, it makes no economic sense to build a new nuclear power plant. Is there a difference, Arnie, in between countries that uh, were the, say, in India, I know it's the government that finances the new, nucle new nuclear power plants, but in, in the other countries, like in Germany mm -hmm. and, uh, well, any of the South American countries, is it per, P, uh, small companies or nuclear companies who finance it and not the government? You know, that's, a real, that's the key. You know, we've, we have socialized the risk of nuclear by having a government say, we'll buy it, um, because they're, uh, they're going to spread out these cost overruns to millions of, millions of people. So it's in those socialist and communist countries that um, we're seeing the most nuclear, Russia, China, um, um, where a uh, top-down, the, you know, the, 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 the leadership says we're going nuke and we really don't care what the people want. But in the countries that are somewhat democratic, and we're calling s Vietnam a somewhat democratic country now, um, uh, the, the people are saying this doesn't make sense and the leaders are getting the hint. The most interesting example is South Africa. Uh, the leadership in South Africa is quite corrupt and um, they want nuclear power and the odds are they're making huge payoffs in the process. But um, the, 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 the people in the country are saying exactly what we are. This makes no sense. And the finance minister actually quit uh, in South Africa. And he said, I am not going to have my name on a nuclear power plant. This makes no economic sense. So when, when Wall Street has to take the risk, nobody's building them. But when a government stands behind it and Wall Street doesn't have to take the risk, at that point, uh, you know, people are building nukes, but not many, about 30. Well, Grayson, this is mm -hmm. true investigative reporting. I mean, here mm -hmm. you are, you launched yourself while still a student, and you're getting into a whole big scientific world, but also you're going through the process of how to investigate it. Mm -hmm. So tell me some of the intriguing things about that. Um, I mean, and, and also working with, with, the other, uh, with the others, the other mm -hmm. interns. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I guess it was really interesting to be able to use the nuclear world's own data um, to back up our own argument. I, so I think if you can, you know, sometimes you feel like you should just avoid their information entirely sometimes just so you don't, it, it can be frustrating or you know it's biased so you don't want to look at it but if there's a way, if there's a crack in their argument that you can find then that just strengthens your argument all the, all the much more. So mm -hmm. it's very uh, important to diversify your, your background and where you're looking um, and working with the other interns was a really great opportunity. We, really bonded well together and I think we put together a really great argument. It's, it's staggering too, Arnie, because in, in all of your uh, investigation of the Fukushima Daiichi disaster, you found out that there was a lot of ob obfuscation or lying that was going on and uh, that was both frustrating and, and a challenge to you. Mm -hmm. 
You know, that's another case where a government, the Japanese government, wants these nukes to start back up. So they're, they're, um, uh, they're fudging the numbers. You know, they're, they're creating, we just saw it. I was in Japan um, in 2012, and I said, it's going to cost you a half a trillion dollars to clean this plant up. And finally now, the Japanese government is agreeing, it's going to cost almost half a trillion dollars. They didn't want to say that back then because they didn't want to frighten their people about uh, trying to start up these plants that have been shut down. But we see it everywhere. The government and the nuclear industry are in cahoots. Mm. Arnie and, and, uh, and Grayson, we're going to have to, uh, to wrap this up in a few minutes because we're going to lead <laughs> into the two-minute documentary called Smokescreen that you put together. And we're very excited to show this on Channel 17 at the end of this program. But I'd, I'd like you to, uh, to share with us some more of your insights into working with Fairwinds and, and why it's important to, to get the message out. Because for the, our viewers, they're like me, people who are interested, they want, we want to live, in other, we want to live in, in a good way and we want to be informed. So could you tell us something about your insights after this first year? How, how long, yes. Uh, it's really changed my, uh, my outlook on a nuclear. As I said, I kind of came in with a neutral viewpoint, but after seeing all this data, um, it's, it's just really opened my eyes to the direction that we meet, need to move in uh, in order to quickly uh, counteract climate change. Um, ma making new nukes, just it's not feasible economically, and those resources would just be much better used uh, pushing for new renew uh, <laughs> renewables, which can be uh, quickly brought up and constructed within like two to five years for large-scale uh, utili utility um, outputs as opposed to 10 years for nukes. So it just doesn't make sense. Okay. And Arnie? Well, you're, you're going to see in this two-minute video, 18 months of work by 10 people filtered down to two minutes. And, and I, uh, the process that we got there of taking out all the extraneous stuff, how can I explain this thing in two minutes? was exciting and frustrating. And I think in the end of the day, it was really, really worthwhile too. I hope your viewers enjoy it. Okay, thank you very much, Arnie. And thank you very much, Grayson. Thank you. So uh, until next time, and viewers, you're in for this wonderful documentary, a brief di vi video documentary. Thank you so much for watching. And let's, let's, let's blow the smoke screen away. <laughs> thank you, Channel 17. Goodbye for now. In 2015, human activity released 35,810 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. In order to avoid catastrophic climate change, this number must quickly be reduced. Currently, our CO2 production grows by 2% every year as people worldwide seek a more affluent lifestyle. The World Nuclear Association, or WNA, has a plan to solve this problem building 1,000 new nuclear reactors before the year 2050. That means we would need to build a nuclear reactor every 12 days for the next 33 years. Our existing reactors offset only 3% of global emissions. Every time a new reactor goes online, our carbon footprint goes down slightly, and only by this much. Along the way, outdated reactors must be decommissioned, the deadly waste must be tended in perpetuity, and each new reactor built will increase the probability of atomic disaster somewhere in the world. Constructing this infrastructure will cost $8.2 trillion. Even after spending all this money and waiting all this time, by the year 2050, these new nuclear reactors will have offset only 3.9 gigatons of CO2, which is less than 10 to tout CO2 reduction to greenwash its agenda. For the nuclear industry, 8.2 trillion is good business. For humanity, it is an opportunity cost. Precious time and money wasted on the wrong thing. If we follow the WNA, another generation will pass and climate change will only get worse. We already have clean, cheap, and time power is not one of them. The nuclear solution to climate change is a smokescreen. We don't deny science. 
Help us protect the water you drink, the food you eat, and the air you breathe. Radiation knows no borders.